Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Shoals Marine Laboratory's first Rock Talk seminar uh, of this 2021 season. Uh, I'm David Buck, the Associate Director of the Lab. For those of you who are joining us from afar and perhaps aren't uh, familiar with, with the lab, SML is the largest and oldest undergraduate-focused marine lab in the country. Um, the lab is jointly operated by the University of New Hampshire and Cornell University. Uh, we're located <clears throat> in the southern part of the Gulf of Maine uh, within the Isles of Shoals, a group of islands approximately eight to 10 miles offshore of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, the Rock Talk series provides an opportunity for SML, our students, faculty, researchers, and our wider community uh, to come together for a seminar style lecture on current and emerging issues in marine science. Um, this summer, as with last summer, our Rock Talk seminars are evolving with the COVID landscape and we're doing them virtually. But this year we have students on island. Uh, three courses are present with us tonight, uh, field ornithology, sustainable fisheries, and marine parasitology and disease. So we welcome them as our first students of the 2021 season and also welcome the rest of you who are not uh, with us on island this summer. So our format for this evening, uh, will be a 45 minute talk followed by 15 minutes of question and answer. If you'd like to ask a question, um, you should see the Q&A box kind of down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can enter your questions there. Uh, also, if you need any technical help during the course of the seminar, please also uh, put your sort of call for help there in that Q&A box as well. Uh, at the end of our presentation this evening, uh, I'll read the questions out loud and our speaker will address them. So we're very fortunate tonight to have Dr. Emily Choi with us this evening. Emily is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Natural Resource Sciences at McGill University and also at the, uh, has a position in the Environment and Climate Change Canada. She earned her PhD at the University of Manitoba studying beluga whales as sentinel species of environmental change in the Beaufort Sea ecosystem in partnership with the Inuit people who live in the Western Canadian Arctic. She also serves as a scientific advisor for the W. Garfield Weston Foundation, is a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographic Society, and is also a council member of the Association of Field Ornithologists. She currently studies uh, the effects of climate change on thick-billed mirrors, an Arctic seabird with a colony of approximately 30,000 breeding pairs at Code Island in northern Hudson Bay. Um, she's interested in the physiological responses of mirrors to Arctic climate change, specifically the effects of changes in prey availability <clears throat> on their energetics and warming temperatures on their performance. So her rock talk this evening will discuss um, these topics and more related to Arctic seabirds as sentinels of environmental change and anthropogenic stressors in marine ecosystems. So we are very pleased to have Dr. Choi participate in our first rock talk of this 2021 season. Please join me in welcoming her. Uh, Dr. Choi, I will pass the virtual Zoom microphone to you. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for your introduction, David. I'll just share my screen. So good evening, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. So um, again, I'm gonna be presenting to you some of my postdoctoral work, which focuses on Arctic seabirds as sentinels of environmental change, as well as anthropogenic stressors in marine ecosystems. There's several characteristics that make seabirds, thick-billed mers, ideal sentinel species of Arctic change. Uh, thick-billed mers are the most abundant seabird in the Canadian Arctic with a circumpolar distribution so they're found across the Canadian Arctic, but they also have colonies in Svalbard, Norway, Iceland, Greenland, Alaska, Russia, throughout the circumpolar north. They're highly specialized for Arctic environments. Uh, for example, they breed and forage exclusively in waters eight degrees Celsius and lower. Uh, they're also found exclusively in the higher latitudes, unlike their cousin, the common myrrh. They're long lived with a low reproductive rate. So in our last field season prior to COVID, uh, the oldest mer we worked with was 38 years old. And once mer's parents reach around th three to four years of age, they will raise one chick or one have one egg per breeding season. 
and they use many different habitats. So obviously, uh, MERS will nest on the coast, on cliffs. Uh, they actually forage in the offshore environment and they dive to incredible depths. And so, um, you know, um, they use many different ecosystems, which is important for monitoring a complex ecosystem such as Hudson Bay. Now on Coates Island, there's a colony of about 30,000 breeding pairs of thick-billed murres, uh, which nests on the cliffs. Uh, the birds arrive around mid-May. Uh, they start to lay their eggs around late May to early June. Uh, once the chicks fledge around mid-June to early July, uh, the, sorry, once the chicks had the eggs hatch around mid-June to early July, uh, they will tend to fledge around the first or second week of August, which is actually quite an amazing event. Um, the, the chicks will actually jump off the cliffs and then they will actually be reared by their fathers at sea, whereas the mothers will stay behind and basically feed. So during this period, the mers will actually uh, start their migration journey back to their wintering locations. But uh, because they are unable to fly at this point, they'll, the, the chicks will actually swim with their fathers part of the way uh, in the ocean. Uh, and finally, they're also an important traditional subsistence harvest uh, to Inuit communities in Greenland, but they're also harvested in Labrador, Newfoundland, which is where they will spend their winter. So they winter off the coasts of Newfoundland and Labrador. Now, uh, I just thought I would show you, of course, these, it's always amazing to see these birds uh, in person. Uh, so the next best thing, but the next, next best thing because of COVID is uh, video. So I just thought I would show you some drone footage of the Mer colony, just to show you how big it is. Uh, let me know if you can't see the videos or if they don't work. Okay, so here's the Coates Island Mer colony. Uh, as you can see on the cliffs, these little boxes are our blinds. This is where we do our behavioral studies. And we also do feeding watches from these blinds. Uh, you can see on the left, this is the hurricane. So the birds basically will fly in the circle. We're still trying to understand um, what exactly they are doing. But as you can see there, they all nest on the, co the cliffs. There's about 30,000 breeding pairs. And I'm lucky to be part of a long-term study program that's been collecting data for almost 40 years. So here's one drone video. Here's another one closer up. So just to give you an idea of how, what their nests look like. So they basically nest on bare rocks, bare, bare rocks. They don't actually really build a nest. They all have their position on the cliff, like on, on a ledge. And MERS actually will tend to, so MERS parents will actually tend to return to the same ledge uh, to have their nest or lay their eggs year after year. And then finally, I'll just show one more clip. I'll show you. So here's another another viewpoint. Uh, so, you know, some of the predators the MERS face are polar bears will actually, especially with decline in sea ice, uh, polar bears have been kind of attacking the MER colony. You'll actually see them climbing up the cliffs. Uh, there are also Arctic foxes that will sometimes come down. And when the MERS are, sw are swimming, uh, there's also very opportunistic walrus, which will actually treat the MER as well. But overall, it's a very stable, uh, healthy colony. So I'll just reshare my screen to get to the presentation. Uh, if I have time at the end, I'll show you uh, more videos because I have lots. <laughs> so um, recently, have been, there have been declines in mer colonies across the Atlantic. Uh, in particular, colonies in Iceland and Greenland and Norway. Uh, there have been declines in the mer populations, which are believed to be due to changing oceanographic Africa oceanographic conditions. Now, although the Canadian populations and the Coates Island population have been stable, uh, over the past 30 years, the diets have shifted in MERS from about 50% Arctic cod to 50% capelin with the warming of Hudson Bay. Uh, this shift in diet is believed to have caused a decline in chick growth rates. So MER parents will bring back one fish at a time to their chicks. And because of the smaller body size of capelin relative to cod, it's believed that this shift in diet is, is, has caused a decline in chick growth rates based on our long-term monitoring data. 
In addition, in addition uh, the ice-free period around Coates Island has advanced by about a month, which is also the peak period of prey availability, whereas myrrh nesting has only advanced by about a week. Uh, therefore, there is a mismatch between the period in which prey are at their most abundant with the highest energy demands of the MERS, which is the chick rearing period. So one of the overall objectives of my research is to look at the indirect, oh, before I go on about that, um, another key aspect about MER energetics is that they have very, very high energy demands. So these birds uh, will can dive up to 200 meters in a matter of minutes, uh, but they spend up to four hours a day flying during the breeding season. And in birds, flying and diving are an energetic trade-off and it's very difficult to do both. And a good example of this is the penguin, which is an amazing diver, but has lost its ability to fly uh, over time. MERS do both, but as a result, they expend a lot of energy uh, during flight. So their the costs of flight is one of the highest for vertebrates. So a good example of one of the publications my advisor published a few years ago was on the energetic costs of myrrh um, and basic and in comparison to birds with different uh, flight, flight and uh, diving modes. And as you can see, MERS are at the top with the highest energy costs. So they have flapping flight, mostly flapping flight, which you get has requires a high energy cost, but they have, in terms of diving, they actually use wing propelled diving, which actually has a lower cost than foot propelled diving, which is used by other birds, such as the cormorants. Um, so they're specialized there for wing propelled foraging dives. So they're basically built like a diver. And so as a result, they have very low cost of diving, but they have a very high cost of flying. And in particular, during the breeding season, uh, mer parents spend a lot of time flying offshore to collect food and prey for their chicks. So the overall objective of my research is to examine the indirect effects of these prey shifts or prey variation on the energetics and foraging behaviors of seabirds. And I'm doing this with a few novel methods. So um, one technique I'm using is to look at heart rate as a proxy of oxygen consumption and metabolic rate in birds to look at basically fine scale energy demands. And my second objective is to use GPS accelerometers, which not only track the movements of the birds, but can also be used to classify behavior and activity rate in relation to heart rate and energetics. Uh, not only am I looking at MERS, but I'm also studying black-legged kittiwakes uh, on Middleton Island just off the coast of Alaska. Now, if, for those of you unfamiliar with heart rate, it has been used uh, in many studies to look at energy costs in birds. So from interesting studies on migration formation to changes in flight altitude. So this is a paper published in Nature that looked at uh, heart rate and V V flight uh, V shaped formation of flight in uh, pink in um, pelicans. And so, as you can see, heart rate was highly associated with wing break frequency. And depending on where you were uh, in the um, migration formation, so the the bird at the front had the highest energy cost, also had the highest heart rate. And depending on what type of flight and the altitude, also affected. Uh, heart rate as well. So basically, the higher your heart rate, the higher energy costs. And so in 2019, uh, we implanted heart rate loggers in both kittiwakes and MERS for a period of three to four days. It was just a, basically a trial study. And then we collected information on heart rate using an electrocardiogram, which was recorded every five minutes. So this is a, an example of a kittiwake electrocardiogram. Uh, this is the called a QRS waveform. And so basically to estimate the heart rate, you'd basically take the frequency of this, of the QRS waveform, which would indicate the beats per minute. Uh, in addition, we, in order to see whether these heart rate loggers have impact on the bird's behavior or energy, uh, we also, um, we also attach GPS accelerometers to a subset of seabirds, um, birds that had heart rate loggers and birds that were controls that did not to see if they heart rate loggers impacted their behavior. And then we used the accelerometers to classify different modes of behaviors 
and, and seabirds and kitty wakes. So in kitty wakes, we had three types of behaviors. A uh, colony on water when the birds are sitting on the water and in flight. And these behaviors, um, basically the accelerometers give the rate of acceleration in three dimensions of a seabird. And then through that, you can look at fine scale behaviors, but you can also look at you know, very specific activities. So here's an example of a MER um, accelerometry acceleration um, profile, and it can be used to tell, you know, I, I, or identify a prey catching event in a, in a MER. Now, in order to estimate energetic costs, uh, we used activity specific metabolic rates that were previously pu published and showed us at all. So these were specific to kitty wakes and they were based on doubly labeled water. And then in order to estimate the total daily energy expenditures, uh, what we did was we basically estimated the proportion of the behaviors of each of the kitty wakes per day. So how, how much of the, how much time they spent on the colony, on water and in flight. And then we used these activity specific, specific metabolic rates to estimate their daily energy expenditures. So in terms of preliminary results, uh, what we found was the heart rate of kitty wake was much, the average heart rate of kitty wakes were much higher than MERS. So about 370 beats per minute versus 270 beats per minute. Um, kitty wakes are, off, are also half the body size of MERS. So it's about, they were about 500 grams uh, versus a thousand grams and heart rate often scales with body size. So small animals have a much higher heart rate. Um, but we, when we looked at the body temperature, interestingly, um, there was much more greater variation in internal body temperature in kitty wakes than MERS. Um, it might be due to the implantation location, but it also might be because uh, MERS are divers. Uh, studies on MERS, on MERS while they're diving has found that they maintain a very, very stable body temperature, uh, whereas kitty wakes do not. Um, but this is definitely something that we need to investigate further. Now, when we looked at the impacts of the heart rate loggers on the bird's behavior, as well as movements, uh, we found there was no difference between the foraging movements and behavior states of the control implanted birds. So here are some examples with the kitty wakes. Um, so these are um, two maps of residence in space and time models, which are used to classify uh, the movements of the kitty wakes. So it classifies them into three states. So gray is just basically a um, transit state when they're going to and from a foraging site. Uh, red is a resting state, whereas blue is an active foraging state. And we found that there was no difference in the distance or in the, in the, the, uh, the behavioral states of the birds. Now, when we classified behavior based on the accelerometry data, uh, we again found no difference among the proportion the birds spent flying on the water and resting on the colony between control and implanted birds. So as you can see, um, these are the different days of the deployment, so only, only four days. And then we basically estimated based on the accelerometry data, the proportion of the day spent on flight, on water, and on colony, and they were virtually the same. And then finally, when we um, estimated the daily energy expenditures between control birds without heart rate loggers and implanted birds, uh, we found no difference in treatments. Uh, we found that birds for some reason had a higher uh, energy expenditure in day three than, than day four. But um, again, we need to, we're hoping to follow up this experiment with a longer term deployment to see whether this was just a, because we had a small sample size, this might be what this might have influenced our, our data. So in summary, uh, we found that no impact, uh, there was no impact of heart rate, rate loggers on the energy budgets or behaviors of kitty wakes or, or MERS over a short time frame. Uh, and there was no impact on heart rate on reproductive success on kitty wakes. So we did look at, um, uh, based on our kitty wake data, we did have access to um, the uh, reproductive success data from that year. And we found that there was no difference, um, no impact on these of these loggers on the birds reproductive success. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, we haven't been able to return to the field since 2019. So we're hoping to do in that in 2022, we'll do a longer deployment and be able to calibrate more traditional measures of energy expenditure, such as daily labeled water with heart rate loggers. 
and that we will be able to use GPX accelerometers to help to classify specific heart rate patterns um, with specific behaviors, I should say behaviors. So for instance, um, other studies have found that at, you know, when a birds are diving, they'll have a specific heart rate, whereas that, which, which will be different when their birds are in flight. Now, another major question I'm asking in my research are, is are MERS vulnerable to Arctic warming? So Arctic ecosystems are currently warming at approximately twice the global rate. And MER parents will actually spend 12 to 24 hour shifts incubating their nests, sometimes in full sun. And there have actually been reports of MERS dying on their nests due to heat, heat stress on moderate temperature days. So on days of about 21 to 22 degrees Celsius at Coates, which is, which is hot for Coates Island, Hudson Bay, um, but there have been reports at these temperatures of MERS actually, actually dying due to heat stress. So the overall objective, objective of this part of my research is to examine the heat tolerance and heat stress in MERS. And we predicted that as a cold adapted species, MERS would display signs of heat stress at relatively low temperatures in relation to more heat tolerant and desert birds, but also have a very high cost of thermoregulation. So just to give you some background on heat tolerance in endotherms and birds, um, according, this is something called the Scholander model and based on the Scholander model, um, Metabolic rates in endotherms are actually lowest in the thermal neutral zone of the model. So right here, so this is the upper critical temperature. This is the lower critical temperature. So this is basically the ideal temperature zone. But there's been uh, more research done by on thermoregulatory polygons, um, which it can be used to basically predict the ambient temperature in which there is a decline in an animal's performance. So depending on the energy expenditure, um, birds or endotherms can basically adjust their basal metabolic rate through behaviors by using microclimates. But as soon as they're outside of this polygon, they suffer basically a sudden decline in performance. So they're basically safe within this polygon because they can compensate um, through, through behaviors to maintain their ideal body temperature. So in order to measure heat stress in MERS, I used uh, flow through respirometry uh, to identify the onset of heat stress by measuring resting metabolic rates, evaporative water loss, and evaporative cooling efficiencies as physiological responses, uh, increasing temperature increments from about 16 degrees Celsius to 39 degrees Celsius. Uh, in addition, I also monitor cloacal body temperature. Uh, body temperature was another physiological response, but also it was a, and also a safety. Um, it was also for safety as well, because the basically uh, body temperatures above 46 degrees result in mortality in birds. So it was also a check to make sure the MERS were always safe. Uh, this was my setup. So this is basically a MER in a metabolic chamber. And um, around the, surrounding the metabolic chamber, so this is basically a sealed chamber where there's basically air only goes in and out through this, the, the uh, tube. And surrounding the chamber is a heating box, which is insulated. Um, so the way the system works is basically scrubbed air. So air that has been cleaned of both carbon dioxide and water has, will flow through uh, the chamber and basically sample the air of the MER, which would basically flow to a field metabolic system and oxygen concentration as well as water vapor will be met, would be measured. Uh, the box or the, we would start our measurements within the thermal neutral zone of MERS, so starting at around 16 degrees Celsius. And then we would increase the measurements by about two to three degrees Celsius. Now throughout the experiment, we had a video camera at the top. So we were constantly, um, monitoring the bird's behavior. And if there was any stress related behaviors such as wing flapping, uh, they were immediately removed from the chamber and released, so cooled down and released. Um, so the measurements were only taken when the birds were calm and the, bird, the box was heated from the top. So this is basically a Moby cool that would, that would basically um, 
produce heat that would heat the, the chamber and also through the bottom as well. There were some heating pads. Now, in order to identify the onset of heat stress, I use broken stick regressions in order to examine a sudden change in a physiological trait, which is basically the onset of heat stress. And then I use linear mixed effect models to examine the relationship between body mass and air temperature on each of these physiological traits. So in terms of my results, I found that for body temperature, uh, MERS displayed hyperthermia at about 33.7 degrees Celsius, uh, which is low in comparison to other heat tolerant and desert species, but is similar to another bird we studied, which is the snow, the snow, butt, dun, snow butting. So basically this is the temperature in which MERS started to increase their, their body temperature and air temperature overall above the inflection point uh, best predicted body temperature. But overall, MERS displayed a very poor ability to increase their, their body temperature with a very low mean maximum as well as maximum body temperature relative to other birds. And this is important because um, increasing high, facultative hyperthermia is actually a strategy that endotherms or birds use to conserve water. But MERS displayed a very poor ability, ability to do this. Now, in terms of our results for resting metabolic rate, we found that MERS started to increase the resting metabolic rates at about 29.9 degrees Celsius, uh, which is again, low in comparison to heat tolerant species, but similar to other cold adapted birds, uh, the snow bunting and several species of penguin. And MERS overall uh, expended, had very high metabolic rates. So they had displayed a very, great magnitude of increase in resting metabolic rates over a narrow temperature, narrower temperature range than more heat tolerant species. Uh, so overall, relative to their body mass, uh, MERS actually have a very, very high resting metabolic rate, which is believed to be an adaption to living in a cold climate. And that through the experiment, they just increase their, their resting metabolic rates by a, at a very, very high magnitude in comparison to other species. Uh, so when we looked at the best models or the predictors of resting metabolic rates, we found that body mass, air temperature, as well as their interaction best predicted resting metabolic rate, and overall larger MERS experienced a higher rate of increase in resting metabolic rate than smaller MERS. So basically I divided the birds into three, two mass groups, so below and uh, above and below 900 uh, grams and so the the um, MERS that were hot that had a body mass higher than 900 grams had a steeper slope or a higher rate of re increase in resting metabolic rate than birds that were smaller than 900 grams. Uh, in terms of evaporative water loss, uh, MERS increased their evaporative water loss rates at 21.2 degrees Celsius which is very low relative to heat tolerant species, but also low relative to the snow bunting, a cold adapted species. Uh, they also began panting at 25.9 degrees Celsius, which is also very low. Uh, however, 21.2 is has ecological relevance. So it's very similar um, to the air temperatures at Coates Island in which MERS experienced heat stress. Overall, MERS displayed a very low magnitude of increase in evaporative water loss. So they, ex they exhibited a very low ability to increase their water loss rates, which is the best very limited ability to cool themselves and dissipate heat. Uh, when I looked at the best models predicting evaporative water loss, uh, similar to resting metabolic rates, body mass, air temperature, and their interaction best predicted evaporative water loss, However, uh, this time smaller MERS experienced a higher rate of increase in evaporative water loss than larger MERS. So again, I divided MERS into two mass categories, uh, below 900 grams and above 900 grams. And as you can see, um, there's, a much, there's a steeper slope for smaller MERS relative to larger MERS, um, which suggests a, a higher rate of increase in evaporative water loss. Um, which has been supported by studies in the past. Ev um, evaporative water loss is best predicted by body mass and smaller birds or animals are more at risk for um, dehydration at, hot, at high temperatures. 
Now, in terms of evaporative cooling efficiency, which is basically um, the basically just the ratio of evaporative heat loss to metabolic heat production. So basically, it was the ratio of evaporative water loss to resting metabolic rate. Um, we just made a used a conversion to convert the data into watts. Um, and it's also a measure of how well the birds are able to dissipate heat. Uh, what we found was, was that MERS displayed the lowest evaporative cooling efficiency ever reported in birds to our knowledge. So based on what's been published in the, the literature, we could not find a lower value in comparison to MERS. And MERS actually decreased their evaporative cooling efficiencies at 31 degrees Celsius. Uh, so not only is this a low temperature in comparison to heat tolerant species in the snow bunting, but this pattern is actually extremely unusual. So in most birds and endotherms, um, animals will actually get better at dissipating heat at higher temperatures, but MERS actually got worse. So they actually started to produce more heat than they were dissipating above 31 degrees Celsius. So they're very, very poor at dissipating heat. And no MERS were able to dissipate more heat than they produced metabolically. So if they were efficient at dissipating heat, uh, MERS would had, would had values above one, of, above one basically. But the highest value we measured in MERS was 0.33, which suggests that at best, MERS could only dissipate one third of the heat they produced metabolically. Now, in terms of the best models uh, for evaporative cooling efficiency, uh, we found that body mass and air temperature uh, best predicted evaporative cooling efficiency. And this time, larger MERS had poor evaporative cooling efficiency. So there was a sharp decline between body, larger body mass and the evaporative cooling efficiencies in MERS. Uh, in addition, I also compared the body mass of MERS with the maximum air temperatures they were able to tolerate and also found a steady decline between total body mass, so increasing body mass and uh, maximum air temperature. So again, birds, birds that were larger were less able to tolerate maximum air temperatures. So in summary, uh, MERS have limited heat tolerance uh, relative to desert species. I say relative to desert species because unfortunately, well, this is one of the first studies to look at heat tolerance in Arctic birds. Most um, heat physiology or thermal physiology papers have concentrated or focused on cold tolerance. Um, but uh, so this is one of the first to actually look at heat tolerance in, in birds. So the only comparisons we have or I have are desert species. And over a narrow temperature range, uh, MERS displayed limited ability to increase their body temperatures. Uh, which is important in order, in order to conserve water, a higher magnitude of increase in resting metabolic rates. So again, they're expending a lot of energy in order to thermoregulate at higher temperatures. And finally, limited capacity to increase their evaporative water loss, which is important for the MERS to be able to cool themselves. Resting metabolic rates increased at a faster rate in larger birds, whereas evaporative cooling, evaporative water loss increased more rapidly in small birds. And because of this relationship, uh, larger birds have lower evaporative cooling efficiencies and also um, tolerated lower maximum air temperatures and are therefore more vulnerable to heat stress. So finally, um, this is another study that I'm currently working on. So I'm also looking at the impact of multiple stressors on MERS. Um, so Arctic marine ecosystems are facing multiple stressors due to uh, environmental change. Uh, not only is, is there sea ice declining and it's projected to be free of summer, ice, summer sea ice but to, by 2015, but also through long range transport, um, there's several contaminants that have from southern regions that have made their way to the Arctic. So these contaminants, um, you know, they with a lot of many of them, you know, they they enter the air with war and travel through um, at the basically they rise with the uh, in the warm air and basically they start to fall at the, in, in the and the colder climates and eventually reach the Arctic. Uh, seabirds are considered not only sentinels of ecosystem health, but they're also sentinels of contaminants because they tend to be um, arpertrophic predators. They, they feed on fish, 
and uh, carry on, and, and as well as they also feed from marine ecosystems, which tend to be more contaminated in the Arctic than terrestrial um, systems. So the overall objective of, my, of this part of my work is to examine the impact of multiple stressors and changes in prey uh, or prey variation, habitat use, as well as changing environmental conditions such as sea ice in relation to contaminants in MERS. Um, I'm also looking at another factor to, to consider is that because of you know, the decline of sea ice and changing conditions in Hudson Bay, there's a lot more um, human activities such as increased in shipping. So so I'm hoping to use this data to basically infer um, habitat quality for which that might might or habitat quality that might overlap with shipping proposed shipping routes. So just to give you some background on contaminants in MERS, so I've been focusing on total mercury as well as perfluoral per and polyfluoral alkyl alkyl substances. Um, so mercury is a neurotoxin and a very persistent uh, pollutant. And the most toxic form of mercury is methylmercury, which biomagnifies in the food web. So here is a, is a, a food web uh, schematic by Leonard et al. So basically it biomagnifies um, from the lower trophic levels. And once it reaches higher, um, higher trophic levels and top predators, it tends to be at its highest uh, concentrations. Uh, PFAS, on the other hand, are found in many commercial products such as Teflon, and certain congeners will biomagnify in food webs. Uh, in order to infer diet, I'm using stable isotope ratios, uh, which can be used to uh, not only look at the trophic link linkages of seabirds and predators, but also reconstruct the diet. Uh, so this is some of my beluga work from my PhD. Um, so um, if, for those of you unfamiliar with stable isotopes, uh, nitrogen can be used to indicate trophic position. So it tends to increase about three to five per mil with every trophic transfer, whereas carbon and can be used to um, examine changes in baseline primary production. So carbon tends to not change as much uh, with trophic position, but it tends to vary with ecosystem. Uh, as well as sulfur. So I'm also looking at sulfur. So here are the different prey of the beluga. And so you can see, you know, isopods versus fish versus beluga. You can see that there's a steady increase with nitrogen up the food web. And there's also differences in carbon uh, depending on what ecosystem, so more pelagic versus uh, benthic, um, these organisms, organisms are a part of. So um, for MERS, um, from 2016 to 2018, uh, we measured total mercury and per and polyfluoral alkyl substances in blood samples of nesting MERS. So we used blood because it would be an indicator of recent contaminants from the diet uh, at Coates Island. So it has a much higher turnover rate. And we, I also measured, we also measured carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur stable isotopes in the blood in order to infer diet sources of these contaminants. And then finally, um, in order to track the movements of the MERS to get some idea of where these birds were feeding, uh, we used GPS accelerometers, which we attached to the backs in order to track the movements, but also classify the behaviors of MERS. Uh, so, so far in terms of results, um, what we found is that um, from 2016 and 2018, both contaminants varied with year as well as stable isotope ratios. Uh, for example, uh, 2018, which was a late ice year, so it had a that there was a much um, the basically the ice free period occurred much later uh, in 2018 relative to previous years. But total mercury was also at its highest, um, whereas PFOS was actually lowest in 2018 relative to the, the uh, earlier previous years, which were early ice years. So basically, the sea ice retreated much earlier, 2016 and 2017. Um, there was also variation in total mercury and PFOS, or total mercury with stable isotopes. So total mercury concentrations increased with carbon and nitrogen, nitrogen stable isotopes, but decreased with sulfur. So as you can see, um, MERS with higher total mercury also had um, higher carbon signals. Um, they same similar to nitrogen as well, but in terms of car, um, sulfur, 
uh, MERS with um, higher total mercury actually had lower stable sulfur isotopes, which suggests that MERS with higher total mercury concentrations were feeding on higher trophic and benthic prey. Now, in terms of PFOS, we actually found the opposite. So PFOS concentrations decreased with carbon stable isotopes, but increased with sulfur stable isotopes. And there was no relationship with nitrogen stable isotopes. So it didn't vary with trophic position. Uh, so these are, these are the relationships. As you can see, there's a study just of some, I mean, I could have shown the individual congeners, but this is basically the sum of all the, the 22 PFOS congeners. There's a steady decline in um, PFOS concentration with carbon, uh, whereas um, PFOS increased uh, with, with sulfur. Um, so which suggests that MERS with higher PFOS concentrations were feeding from offshore more pelagic prey. And finally, um, there was also variation in stable isotope values with, um, between carbon and sulfur stable isotope values with, with year and sea ice. So carbon values in MERS were highest in 2018, uh, similar to total mercury and lowest in 2016 and 2017, whereas sulfur values were lowest in 2018. So one of the questions we're currently looking at is whether this variation in sea ice, because we had a really a definite um, low ice, late ice versus uh, early ice year, could have influenced the diets of MERS as well as the contaminants. So in order to explore this hypothesis, um, we're currently looking to see whether um, total mercury as well as PFOS are influenced by, by changes in the diet, habitat use, and ice conditions of the MERS. Um, so to do this for, I'm using GPS accelerometry to map the contaminant concentrations of MERS relative to their foraging locations. So I'm using, based on the accelerometers and the tracking data, I'm looking at areas where the birds are exclusively diving um, above, uh, below three, at depths greater than three meters for their prey. So um, here are some maps. So this is basically a map of, as you can see, each of these points are a basically a dive location of the birds. And I've just basically mapped the mercury concentrations of each of the individual MERS. So this is in 2017, 2018, also 2016. These are the dates, years with the most plentiful data. And so I'm gonna, we're following this up with basically a habitat analysis to see whether there's a difference in habitat use, which we hoped to relate to sea ice. And here we're doing the same thing with PFOS as well. So I'm basically mapping the dive locations of MERS uh, in relation to PFOS concentrations to see whether there could be some association between diet, habitat, and sea ice and contaminant concentrations. So in summary, um, well, don't, uh, although there's a, obviously a lot of factors affecting the MERS, I don't forget that this is a very stable, healthy population, but they are facing multiple stressors due to climate change. Uh, shifts in prey and possibly energetics, uh, increasing air temperatures, which might lead to heat stress, and contaminants, which may be influenced by not only diet, but environmental conditions. Um, so we hope to use this data by, through understanding the impacts of these multiple stressors, may assist with the con conservation of MERS by applying it, um, but by applying the data to risk maps in order to assess critical and sensitive habitat. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge both my supervisors, Dr. Kyle Elliott and Dr. Grant Kilcrest, as well as my many collaborator collaborators for this research, so Dr. Kim Fernie, Jonathan Green, Anna Hargraves, Oliver Love, and Fr Francois Vezina, as well as Scott Hatch. Uh, my field crew for, at Coates Island, as well as Middleton Island for their assistance, as well as technical support. Of course, we have community support um, from Coral Harbor. And thank you for your attention, and I'd be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Emily. That was, uh, that was fascinating. Really appreciate uh, you giving that presentation to us. So um, we have we have a handful of questions in the Q and A, and I imagine there'll be a few more that, that come through. Um, the first question that that came up, I think, um, 
comes after seeing the drone video that you shared. Someone is asking, are the birds you test hatched from uh, an egg at your lab or do you go out and capture them? Um, and if you capture them, then how do you do that without injuring the birds or yourself? So yes, they're all, all of this work is done in the field. Um, so we actually capture the birds while we're on, like uh, while they're on their nest. So we use something called a, uh, uh, there's a, uh, so we use a, a kind of a field noose. So we basically um, have a noose trap where we basically um, loop the birds around their neck and basically pull them up. And then we are able to mm -hmm. attach GPS accelerometers. It, it doesn't hurt the birds. The birds are, are fine. Um, but we, we, we trap them while they're on their nests with these, these noose poles. And then we're able to, to, um, to you know, do measurements of the birds um, yeah, as well as you know, ban them but also do our kind of our blood sampling and GPS work on them as well. Gotcha. Do you have a spotter over the ledge so that you're able to actually see where the noose is going? Um, so we can see so them clearly. But we can see them clearly. So when we're doing our work, um, we're all strapped into the <laughs> so that we have like there's a big ropes course, so we're strapped into the onto the cliffs, we're all harnessed in. And you can basically, you know, the we get fairly close to the birds. I mean, the program has been going on for almost over 30 years. So the birds are actually quite used to people. So we get actually quite close to them on our ledges. So yeah, we, we can cool. see them quite well when we're using our news poles. <laughs> cool. Um, so this next question is more about um, their limited heat tolerance. So the um, Johnny Drum is asking if, or is, if it's known that mirrors have, since it's known that mirrors have limited heat tolerance, or is this something that has been changing over time um, and evolving? Uh, well, actually, our study is, has been basically the first to look at heat tolerance okay. in birds. So, um, yeah, we don't know if this has evolved over time or changed. I mean, there has been work on, done on cold tolerance. In MERS, they can um, they can withstand very low temperatures, but there hasn't been done any work done on heat. So yes, we really don't know how much this has changed. Whether this has had an impact on maybe possibly body size. Um, so we really hope to continue, you know, examining this. Uh, we we do know that yeah, um, Tony Gaston in the '90s or actually or 2000s studied published some work on the '90s which looked at um, basically documented the mortalities of MERS on their nests at temperatures, but it was most, mostly kind of a observational study. So he looked at behaviors, he found that they were panting, they were wing spreading, and they were actually mortalities and heavy loss of eggs as well. So they were abandoning their nests um, on, on uh, days where there, there were high temperatures, but also uh, for birds that were positioned uh, in full sun. So depending on the orientation of the bird's nest on the cliffs, they're either exposed to full sun or they're in the shade. And those, the birds that were in full sun on hot temperature days, as well as mosquitoes also played a, played a factor too, but those were the birds that were, um, that uh, were facing heat stress and were, were dying. Interesting. So the next question is a, is maybe a follow-up to that. There's uh, Gary Cox is curious if there's any kind of behavior that the mirrors exhibit to, to cool off. Do they jump in the water or what's, um, and what's the typical water temperature near the colony? I, uh, yes. So the, the, so the temp, the water temperature is fairly cold. It's again, it's, it's usually around eight degrees or lower usually. And if there's ice, obviously it's, it's, it's a lot, lot lower, but I guess the main concern of heat stress in birds is when they're is when they're incubating. So when they're incubating, they are basically dedicated to their nest. They're less likely to leave. Uh, in particular, um, when they're on their their um, nest shifts. So when one bird is um, is foraging at sea, the other bird will spend about a twelve hour shift on their nests, and they're very very reluctant to leave their nest because again, if they do, there's lots of glaucous glaucous gulls, which will um, scavenge, steal their eggs, there's arctic foxes, and so they're, some of these birds are so reluctant to leave their, their nest that they will, they will actually, will die. Um, but yes, we found that um, the birds will cool off 
uh, particularly at the end of our, our study experiment, the birds basically immediately flew to the ocean and then they would be mm -hmm. cool off. Interesting. Um, let's see, I think there are, looks like there are a handful of questions from uh, Mary Everett, which I'm guessing she's fielding questions from the field ornithology class. Um, first question is, um, Let's see. In the heart rate box plot, uh, they're wondering, <clears throat> excuse me, why are kittiwakes compared to mures? Why, why do they make good comparative study? That's a good question. Um, so, uh, I mean, they are, we basically um, use kittiwakes because they, I mean, it wasn't really more of, of a, a choice based on you know a similar species. It was more of a kind of a convenience choice. They're actually much more easier to do um, heart rate work on, particularly the setup on um, Middleton Island. Um, they uh, you know it's a, it's a really really convenient location where the birds there's there's a, it's basically a watchtower that's been converted to this this kitty wake uh, nesting area. So it was a much easier. Um, uh, easier study and uh, training area to do heart rate loggers on MERS. Um, I mean, I, I made the comparison because it was really interesting in terms of, you know, they're, they're very different. Uh, you know, mer kitty wakes are about half the, the body size of MERS, so 500 mm -hmm. grams versus 1,000. They also have different modes of flight. Kitty wakes, MERS are divers versus uh, kitty wakes do not dive. Um, so, I mean, it's two different species, but they're, uh, in terms of, um, but, but yeah, like they were just, uh, you know, two different birds that we happened to do this work on. Kitty Wicks was just more, e it was much easier to facilitate the work for training and we had a much better. Sure. <laughs> um, great, thanks for that answer. Um, the next, it's an anonymous attendee, so I'm not sure who's asking this question. But it's um, about the sort of second part of your talk about the contaminants. They're asking, um, if you can uh, connect concentrations in birds to particular prey items. Um, we're looking into that. So we do have a prey library of stable isotope values um, that um, we are currently analyzing. So possibly through a, a mixing model, uh, we may, we are hoping we will basically analyze the stable isotopes of the three isotopes of MERS relative to prey. So yes, that's something that we are planning to do in the future. Great, sure. Um, another question from an anonymous attendee, which they may be revealing themselves with this question. I'm guessing they're parasite students. Um, do you know anything about how parasites may affect the differences in physiological tolerances um, among different individuals? That's a good question. And I do not believe there are any parasitologists doing work uh, on that right now in Coates Island, but it's something definitely to, to look into in the future. Sure. Um, let's see. Here's a question from Mary Everett in the field ornithology class. Um, does colonial nesting contribute to the issue of heat stress? So in other words, does the closeness of individuals increase the rate of onset for hyperthermia? That's a good question that I don't believe, you know, we, we really haven't looked at yet. Um, we're hoping to do a follow-up study next field season to look at the influence of microhabitats and the position on the cliffs. So that's definitely something we could take into consideration because they do they do nest quite closely to one another, um, but no, that doesn't that that hasn't been looked at. But we are definitely looking to um, create basically models uh, with eye buttons that basically uh, like it's basically a printout of the mer, like a three D model to look at the influence of look at operative temperatures. So that's like the temperature that the birds actually experience and the influence of microhabitats and positioning on the nests, uh, position on the cliffs and other factors that could influence uh, heat stress. Yeah, uh, I think this, this next question you, you may have already addressed with the, the comment about the 1990s studies that were published in the 2000s, but uh, the question is how is hypothermia, uh, hyperthermia linked to mortality rates? Yes, so um, again, um, Tony, Tony Gaston recently uh, had, had published about uh, 10 years ago, a few studies in the 90s, but also in 2011 was a really warm year. 
um, in which they were basically documenting cases of MERS dying on their nests and uh, abandoning their nests, so losing their eggs on basically warmer years, 21 to 22 degrees Celsius, as well as years with, um, along with the warming temperatures, there's been a lot of increase in mosquitoes uh, on Coates Island too. So the birds were not only being, um, you know, uh, just uh, undergoing heat stress, but they were also being attacked by mosquitoes, parasitized mostly on their, their legs as well. So these, uh, Tony Gaston found that these two factors were contributing to uh, nest abandonment, but also mortality to MERS. Interesting. Um, I, I like this next question. Um, how do the eggs stay on the cliffs? <laughs> it's <laughs> It seems like such an extreme environment, and they're, um, it's impressive to see those eggs on the cliff. So any, any comment on that? Uh, well, the shape of the eggs, they're actually kind of a blong and blue. And um, yeah, like um, I, there's some videos of us measuring them, but they, I think that the shape of them um, helps. The cliff ledges are also fairly flat, so the birds will actually um, kind of balance their eggs. On, on the ledge, um, but yeah, I think the shape helps. I mean, they will occasionally, they do lose their eggs. Sometimes, you know, a mer will crash into another mer's nest or they'll just roll off the cliffs. But for the most part, they tend to stay. I think it's because of the, the shape. And they must be incredibly sure-footed. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think a, a question snuck into the chat that I'm gonna, I'm gonna pivot to real quick. This is from, uh, Elizabeth Craig, who's out on White and Seavey Island, uh, she says, thanks, Dr. Choi, great presentation. Um, how do you interpret the variability in sulfur isotopes in your system in terms of foraging ecology and diet? Um, so we're using basically a sulfur as an indicator of um, more marine, uh, of a uh, 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 indicator of more of a pelagic marine influence. Um, so um, we're currently, so um, um, what, what we're, I'm currently in the process of doing is applying that to like a mixing model. Um, obviously uh, the birds, in terms of prey, they have, there's several, there's a few different species. So we're hoping that the one, that the addition of a sulfur isotope will, will lend to more tracers uh, in order to identify their specific eating habits. But yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a, an effective tracer for the marine uh, environment. Thanks. Um, there's a, another question from Mary Everett in the Field O class. Um, this is interesting. Was there a way to look at heat stress adaptation over breeding seasons? Um, and also in the box, I'm, I'm not sure what they mean by in the box. I'm assuming that's from, from the, the viewing box that you showed on the cliff, but were, were individuals tested repeatedly so that you could see any changes year over year, or season over season? Um, no, uh, only because it was the first year we'd ever done the study. Oh, so, gotcha. But definitely, um, hope, hopefully in the future, once we get back out to Coates, we'll, we'll be able to, um, to answer some of these questions of whether there's any, uh, you know, adaptation or, you know, uh, better heat tolerance in individuals over time, but uh, currently too preliminary to see. I, I was interested, you know, you said this study has been going on for 30 plus years and some of your graphs suggested that, um, you know, the, the smaller birds may be able to manage the heat better. Um, is there, can you see any trends in overall, you know, mean size of the entire colony or anything like that in the longer term data sets? Yes, so, so the monitoring, the overall monitoring program has been going on for, for 30 years. And I mean, that, that's an interesting question because um, there's benefits to being a larger bird. So larger birds can actually forage the deeper water. They believe to have more tolerance to colder temperatures, but also larger breeding success. So there's definitely, you know, a conflict between, um, you know, um, if there's a selection for smaller body sizes of warmer temperatures, that's in com conflict. That's a conflict with what's best for breeding, breeding success, but also what's best for foraging. And so I don't believe at this point there's been um, there's been a, any 
signs of kind of a, like a selection between um, for a particular body size, but I, 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 based on you know previous studies, it seems that being there was uh, there's a lot of benefits to being large. So definitely, if you know warming temperatures become more of a problem or greater problem at coats, there could be some a conflict between um, body size and, and uh, body size and others in classes. We are, um, I just looked at my clock and I apologize. We're, we're at that 8.30 hour. Um, could I sneak in one more question? Yes. Uh, and then um, for those of you in the audience, uh, Dr. Choi uh, gracefully, graciously offered to field any other questions uh, via email. So after the, the seminar is over, perhaps there can be some conversation over email. Um, so the last question for the evening, um, do males establish nest sites and or incubate uh, slash share those duties equally with the females or is their contribution more limited to post-fledging? Uh, so the males share the nest of incubation duties equally with females. Uh, I'm not sure who establishes the nest site first. Usually birds, um, they, at least the older birds that have been tagged, they tend to return to the nest, same nest site year after year and with the same mates. But males and females share the same, share basically nesting duties, uh, incubation duties. And yes, uh, when the chicks fledge, it's the male that basically raises the chick at sea, whereas the female, I guess, basically um, stays behind and feeds and flies. Um, during the migration back to Newfoundland and Labrador. Interesting. Well, once again, thank you so much for spending this past hour with us. It was a fascinating talk. Um, I'm sure you're eagerly awaiting the chance to get back to the field. Um, I know this summer has given the lab a chance to get kind of get back into the field and it feels great. Um, so I wish you all the very best in, in your future work. Thank you so much for spending the night with us. Um, and with that note, I think we will mark the end of our first of many 2021 Rock Talk seminar. So please, everyone, join me in thanking Emily Choi for uh, joining us tonight and giving us such a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. It was a real pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay, take care.